Have you ever considered the paradoxical nature of the tree of life? How can one tree represent two entities and yet, be one entity? It's a fascinating concept to delve into, isn't it? The tree of life as described in the sacred texts is not just one, but a dual entity. It's intriguing to note that Jesus and the Holy Ghost are symbolized by the two trunks of this one tree. They are two, yet they are one, united at the top just like the tree of life. The tree of life, then, is a complex symbol, a union of the masculine and the feminine, a marriage of the spiritual and the physical. Jesus is like the tree of life, a source of spiritual nourishment, strength and salvation. And the Holy Ghost, often referred to as wisdom in the scriptures, is also likened to a tree of life, a source of wisdom, understanding, and enlightenment. This duality in unity is a central theme in the concept of the tree of life. This is further illustrated in the scriptures. Ezekiel's vision of a masculine tree whose leaves are for medicine is complemented by John's vision of a feminine tree whose leaves are for the healing of nations. The two visions, while distinct, share a common purpose and are united in their mission, much like Christ and the Holy Ghost. The tree of life, then, is not just a symbol, but a representation of the divine relationship between Jesus and the Holy Ghost. They are two distinct entities, yet united in their essence, their purpose, and their love for humanity. As followers of Christ, we too have access to the tree of life, the divine wisdom and spiritual nourishment it offers. Through Christ's sacrifice, we are given the opportunity to partake in the fruit of the tree of life, to immerse ourselves in the wisdom and comfort offered by the Holy Spirit. To truly understand the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, we must see her as a sister, a member of our own spiritual family, this familial bond signifies our rebirth into the family of the prophesying spirit, a spiritual awakening that is key to entering the kingdom of God. Thus, the tree of life is not just a symbol, but a divine reality. It is a representation of our spiritual journey, our quest for wisdom, and our path to salvation. It symbolizes the unity of Jesus and the Holy Ghost, their shared purpose, and their love for humanity. So, the tree of life, in its dual nature, serves as a reminder of the divine unity of Jesus and the Holy Ghost, and their shared mission to guide, to heal, and to save. It's a symbol that encapsulates the essence of our faith and guides us on our spiritual journey. So the next time you come across the Tree of Life, remember its dual nature. Remember the unity it symbolizes, the wisdom it offers, and the spiritual nourishment it provides. Remember that it represents Jesus and the Holy Ghost, two distinct entities united in their divine purpose. And remember that through faith in Christ, you too have access to this tree of life, to the wisdom and comfort it offers. And that's the extraordinary dual nature of the tree of life, a symbol of unity, a source of wisdom, and a guide on our spiritual journey. The Holy Spirit, wisdom, herself, by her counsels, will show us the way to the tree of life. To all who believe, he is as the tree of life in the paradise of God. His branches reach to this world, that the blessings which he has purchased for us, may be brought within our reach. He has given us a comforter, the Holy Spirit, which will present to us the precious fruit from the tree of life. From this tree we may pluck and eat, and we may then guide others to it, that they also may eat. Thus is how the way of the tree of life is kept for those who appreciate the fruits of the paradise of God, and the requirement set forth to preserve that way. They must receive the fruit of that tree through the Comforter, the one who sees that we are not orphans, the Holy Spirit, the one Jesus sent in his name, by receiving in our hearts and minds her wisdoms, counsel, and reproof. It has been said that, to all who believe, he is as the tree of life in the paradise of God. This, he is as the Son of God. Yet as a man, he himself had access to the fruit of the tree of life, from a source we may access. They even regarded the precepts of men more highly than the word of God. And they were greatly annoyed at the clear penetration of Jesus in distinguishing between the false and the true. They recognized that his education was of a higher type than their own. But they did not discern that he had access to the tree of life, a source of knowledge of which they were ignorant. He, as a man, received the fruit from the tree of life the same way we do. He has given us a comforter, the Holy Spirit, which will present to us the precious fruit from the tree of life. Speaking of the comforter, Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. John 14, 16. It is also written, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2, 1. The above highlighted words, comforter and advocate, 
are translated from the same Greek word, paraclete. Thus we see that the scriptures reveal two comforters, two advocates. This truth is further revealed in the book of Revelation. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22, 1, 2. In essence, the tree of life embodies a multifaceted symbol of profound spiritual significance. It represents the interconnectedness of all life, the never-ending cycle of growth, decay and rebirth, and the eternal quest for enlightenment. At its core, the tree of life is a testament to the divine wisdom, the nurturing spirit of the comforter, and the salvific power of faith. The tree of life is not just a symbol but a pathway, a source of wisdom and knowledge accessible to all who are open to receive its fruits. It is the embodiment of divine wisdom and the Holy Spirit. Through the Comforter, we are granted the precious fruit from this tree, the blessings that it holds. Like the tree with its branches reaching out, the blessings of the Tree of Life extend to us, bringing within our reach the divine wisdom that it symbolizes. It is through the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, that we access these blessings. And just like a tree that is firmly rooted on both sides of the river, the tree of life spans the physical and the spiritual, the human and the divine. It is a bridge between worlds, a conduit of divine wisdom, and a testament to the interconnectedness of all things. In the end, the way of the tree of life is not a destination, but a journey. A journey of faith, of seeking wisdom, and of striving to live in harmony with the divine and with each other. It is a journey that demands patience, humility, and a willingness to learn and grow. In closing, the Tree of Life is a profound symbol of spiritual awakening and enlightenment. It is a testament to the divine wisdom, the nurturing spirit of the Comforter, and the salvific power of faith. It is a journey, a pathway to divine wisdom and knowledge and a bridge between the physical and the spiritual. The Word of God, like the character of its divine author, presents mysteries which can never be fully comprehended by finite beings. It directs our minds to the Creator, who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. It presents to us His purposes, which embrace all the ages of human history, and which will reach their fulfillment only in the endless cycles of eternity. It calls our attention to subjects of infinite depth and importance relating to the government of God and the destiny of man. As to how the Holy Spirit, Wisdom, will today yield her fruits to us monthly, we need only to look at what took place on the new moons in the Old Testament times, and compare that with the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament times. It is written, And she called to her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men, and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor the Sabbath. By this we see that her husband understood that it was customary for them to go to the man of God, the prophet, on the new moons and the Sabbaths. It was at these times that the Holy Spirit would yield her fruit, wisdom, through the prophets to the people that they may eat thereof, and grow spiritually. These times of instruction were accompanied by appointed burnt offerings and sin offerings. As the great things of God's law would come to the attention of those who came to the prophets, the sins which they committed through overt actions or through a failure to do what was right when they could have, came to their minds and they found themselves in need of an intercessor with God. Such a gracious provision was revealed symbolically in the appointed burnt and sin offerings of those times. Thus the whole purpose of the day of the new moon centered on the prophetic gift, the prophesying Holy Spirit of God, the testimony of Jesus, working in concert with the ceremonial law. That the prophetic gift, the gift of wisdom's voice, is of prime importance to his people, God has declared, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Though many sincere people believe that there is no more truth yet to be revealed, and that all they need to know is contained in the Bible, the Bible itself, declares that there still remains truths to be revealed about things which God has hidden. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Wisdom invites us to eat of her bread. This promise of eating of the hidden manna is to those who overcome. What is there to overcome? Simplicity, scorning, hatred of knowledge and dullness of hearing. 
that these new moons, these times of instruction and intercession, were appointed to be times of joy and thanksgiving, we read, Sing aloud unto God our strength, make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take a psalm and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the psaltery. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon, in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. For this was a statute for Israel, and a law of the God of Jacob. Psalm 81, 1, 4. That they were to be Sabbaths of rest from servile work we read, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great and falsifying the balances by deceit? Amos 8, 4, 5. That not only were they to be special times of spiritual rest and refreshing, but that they contained a prophetic symbolism, a shadow of things to come, Colossians 2, 17. We read, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. Leviticus 23, 24. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work, it is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. Numbers 29, 1. And that the new moons were special times of social bonding we read. And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat, but let me go, that I may hide myself in the field unto the third at even. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and thou shalt be missed, because thy seat will be empty. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. 1 Samuel 25 18 24 in 20. That this new moon ordinance is to continue throughout eternity we read, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 66 22, 23. Thus we see that the heavenly bodies which demarcate the feasts of the Sabbath and the new moon, and which also symbolize our two heavenly intercessors, Christ, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Moon, will remain forever as signposts and memorials to the glory of God. On those new moons we will be eating of the tree of life as he, Ezekiel 47, 12, as one trunk of the tree, and she, Revelation 22, 2, the other trunk of the tree, jointly bring forth their fruits for our refreshing. As we have also seen, we as a body, may now have access to the tree of life, through the presence of the Holy Ghost, guiding the church. This gift of present truth brought through the ever-living spirit of prophecy in a timely manner, is the access to the tree of life which alone can nourish and sustain the church. Yet we as individuals must also feast upon the fruit of this tree, that the gift of heavenly wisdom may find reception in the hearts of the believers, and thus the church will looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. Song of Solomon 610